Jack London John Griffith Jack London was an American author, journalist, and social activist. He was a pioneer in the then burgeoning world of commercial magazine fiction and was one of the first fiction writers to obtain worldwide celebrity and a large fortune from his fiction alone. Some of his most famous works include The Call of the Wild and White Fang, both set in the Klondike Gold Rush, as well as the short stories To Build a Fire, An Odyssey of the North, and Love of Life. He also wrote of the South Pacific in such stories as The Pearls of Parley, and The Heathen, and of the San Francisco Bay Area in The Sea Wolf. London was a passionate advocate of unionization, socialism, and the rights of workers and wrote several powerful works dealing with these topics such as his dystopian novel The Iron Heel, his non-fiction Expose the People of the Abyss, and The War of the Classes. Family Jack London's mother, Flora Wellman, was the fifth and youngest child of Pennsylvania canal builder Marshall Wellman and his first wife, Eleanor Garrett Jones. Marshall Wellman was descended from Thomas Wellman, an early Puritan settler in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Flora left Ohio and moved to the Pacific Coast when her father remarried after her mother died. In San Francisco, Flora worked as a music teacher and spiritualist claiming to channel the spirit of an Indian chief. Biographer Clary Storse and others believe London's father was astrologer William Chaney. Flora Wellman was living with Chaney in San Francisco when she became pregnant. Whether Wellman and Chaney were legally married is unknown. Most San Francisco civil records were destroyed by the extensive fires that followed the 1906 earthquake. Nobody knows what name appeared on his birth certificate. Storse notes that in his memoirs, Cheney refers to London's mother Flora Wellman as having been his wife. He also cites an advertisement in which Flora called herself Florence Wellman Cheney. According to Flora Wellman's account, as recorded in the San Francisco Chronicle of June 4, 1875, Cheney demanded that she have an abortion. When she refused, he disclaimed responsibility for the child. In desperation, she shot herself. She was not seriously wounded, but she was temporarily deranged. After giving birth, Flora turned the baby over to ex-slave Virginia Prentice, who remained a major maternal figure throughout London's life. Late in 1876, Flora Wellman married John London, a partially disabled Civil War veteran, and brought her baby John, later known as Jack, to live with the newly married couple. The family moved around the San Francisco Bay Area before settling in Oakland, where London completed grade school. In 1897, when he was 21 and a student at the University of California, Berkeley, London searched for and read the newspaper accounts of his mother's suicide attempt and the name of his biological father. He wrote to William Chaney, then living in Chicago. Chaney responded that he could not be London's father because he was impotent. He casually asserted that London's mother had relations with other men and averred that she had slandered him when she said he insisted on an abortion. Cheney concluded that he was more to be pitied than London. London was devastated by his father's letter. In the months following, he quit school at Berkeley and went to the Klondike. Early Life London was born near 3rd and Brannan's Streets in San Francisco. The house burned down in the fire after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. The California Historical Society placed a plaque at the site in 1953. Although the family was working class, it was not as impoverished as London's later accounts claimed. London was essentially self-educated. In 1885, London found and read Udder's long Victorian novel Sina. He credited this as the seed of his literary success. In 1886, he went to the Oakland Public Library and found a sympathetic librarian, Ina Coolbrith, who encouraged his learning. She later became California's first poet laureate and an important figure in the San Francisco literary community. In 1889, London began working 12 to 18 hours a day at Ikmet's Cannery. Seeking a way out, he borrowed money from his black foster mother Virginia Prentice, bought the sloop Razzle Dazzle from an oyster pirate named French Frank, and became an oyster pirate. In his memoir, John Barleycorn, 
he claims to have stolen French Frank's mistress Mammy. After a few months, his sloop became damaged beyond repair. London became hired as a member of the California Fish Patrol. In 1893, he signed on to the sealing schooner Sophie Sutherland, bound for the coast of Japan. When he returned, the country was in the grip of the Panic of 93 and Oakland was swept by labor unrest. After grueling jobs in a jute mill and a street railway power plant, he joined Kelly's army and began his career as a tramp. In 1894, he spent 30 days for vagrancy in the Erie County Penitentiary at Buffalo, New York. In the road, he wrote, Manhandling was merely one of the very minor unprintable horrors of the Erie County pen. I say imprintable. And injustice I must also say undescribable. They were unthinkable to me until I saw them, and I was no spring chicken in the ways of the world and the awful abysses of human degradation. It would take a deep plummet to reach bottom in the Erie County pen, and I do but skim lightly and facetiously the surface of things as I there saw them. After many experiences as a hobo and a sailor, he returned to Oakland and attended Oakland High School. He contributed a number of articles to the high school's magazine, The Aegis. His first published work was Typhoon Off the Coast of Japan, an account of his sailing experiences. As a schoolboy, London often studied at Arnold's first and last chance saloon, a portside bar in Oakland. At 17, he confessed to the bar's owner, John Arnold, his desire to attend university and pursue a career as a writer. Arnold lent London tuition money to attend college. London desperately wanted to attend the University of California, Berkeley. In 1896, after a summer of intense studying to pass certification exams, he was admitted. Financial circumstances forced him to leave in 1897 and he never graduated. No evidence suggests that London wrote for student publications while studying at Berkeley. While at Berkeley, London continued to study and spend time at Arnold's saloon, where he was introduced to the sailors and adventurers who would influence his writing. In his autobiographical novel, John Barleycorn, London mentioned the pub's likeness 17 times. Arnold's was the place where London met Alexander Maclean, a captain known for his cruelty at sea, on whom the protagonist in London's novel The Sea Wolf, Wolf Larsen, is based. Lionel's first and last chance saloon is now unofficially named Jack London's Rendezvous in his honor. Gold Rush and First Success On July 12, 1897, London, age 21, and his sister's husband Captain Shepard sailed to join the Klondike Gold Rush. This was the setting for some of his first successful stories. London's time in the Klondike, however, was detrimental to his health. Like so many other men who were malnourished in the goldfields, London developed scurvy. His gums became swollen, leading to the loss of his four front teeth. A constant gnawing pain affected his hip and leg muscles, and his face was stricken with marks that always reminded him of the struggles he faced in the Klondike. Father William Judge, the saint of Dawson, had a facility in Dawson that provided shelter, food and any available medicine to London and others. His struggles there inspired London's short story, To Build a Fire, 1902, revised in 1908, which many critics assess as his best. His landlords in Dawson were mining engineers Marshall Latham Bond and Louis Whitford Bond, educated at Yale and Stanford. The brother's father, Judge Hiram Bond, was a wealthy mining investor. The Bonds, especially Hiram, were active Republicans. Marshall Bond's diary mentions friendly sparring with London on political issues as a camp pastime. London left Oakland with a social conscience and socialist leanings. He returned to become an activist for socialism. He concluded that his only hope of escaping the work trap was to get an education and sell his brains. He saw his writing as a business, his ticket out of poverty, and, he hoped, a means of beating the wealthy at their own game. On returning to California in 1898, London began working deliberately to get published, a struggle described in his novel, Martin Eden, serialized in 1908, published in 1909. His first published story since high school was To the Man on Trail, 
which has frequently been collected in anthologies. When the Overland Monthly offered him only $5 for it, and was slow paying, London came close to abandoning his writing career. In his words, literally and literally I was saved, when the Black Cat accepted his story a thousand deaths, and paid him $40, the first money I ever received for a story. London began his writing career just as new printing technologies enabled lower cost production of magazines. This resulted in a boom in popular magazines aimed at a wide public and a strong market for short fiction. In 1900, he made $2,500 in writing, about $71,000 in today's currency. Among the works he sold to magazines was a short story known as either Diable, 1902, or Batard, 1904, in two editions of the same basic story. London received $141.25 for this story on May 27, 1902. In the text, a cruel French Canadian brutalizes his dog, and the dog retaliates and kills the man. London told some of his critics that man's actions are the main cause of the behavior of their animals, and he would show this in another story, The Call of the Wild. In early 1903, London sold The Call of the Wild to the Saturday Evening Post for $750, and the book rights to Macmillan for $2,000. Macmillan's promotional campaign propelled it to swift success. While living at his rented villa on Lake Merritt in Oakland, London met poet George Sterling. In time they became best friends. In 1902, Sterling helped London find a home closer to his own in nearby Piedmont. In his letters London addressed Sterling as Greek, owing to Sterling's aquiline nose and classical profile, and he signed them as Wolf. London was later to depict Sterling as Russ Brashenden in his autobiographical novel Martin Eden, 1910, and as Mark Hall in The Valley of the Moon, 1913. In later life London indulged his wide-ranging interests by accumulating a personal library of 15,000 volumes. He referred to his books as the tools of my trade. First marriage 1900-1904 London married Elizabeth Bessie Madron on April 7, 1900, the same day The Son of the Wolf was edited. Bess had been part of his circle of friends for a number of years. She was related to stage actresses Minnie Madron Fisk and Emily Stevens. Storse says, both acknowledged publicly that they were not marrying out of love but from friendship and a belief that they would produce sturdy children. King Man says, they were comfortable together. Jack had made it clear to Bessie that he did not love her, but that he liked her enough to make a successful marriage. During the marriage, London continued his friendship with Anna Strinsky, co-authoring The Kempton Wake Letters, an epistolary novel contrasting two philosophies of love. Anna, writing Dane Kempton's letters, arguing for a romantic view of marriage, while London, writing Herbert Wake's letters, argued for a scientific view, based on Darwinism and eugenics. In the novel, his fictional character contrasted two women he had known. London's pet name for Bess was Mother Girl, and Bess's for London was Daddy Boy. Their first child, Joan, was born on January 15, 1901 and their second, Bessie, later called Becky, on October 20, 1902. Both children were born in Piedmont, California. Here London wrote one of his most celebrated works, The Call of the Wild. While London had pride in his children, the marriage was strained. King Man says that by 1903, the couple were close to separation as they were extremely incompatible. Nevertheless, Jack was still so kind and gentle with Bessie that when Cloudsley Johns was a house guest in February 1903 he didn't suspect a breakup of their marriage. London reportedly complained to friends Joseph Noel and George Sterling. Storse writes that these were code words for fear that was consorting with prostitutes and might bring home venereal disease. On July 24, 1903, London told Bessie he was leaving and moved out. During 1904, London and Bess negotiated the terms of a divorce, and the decree was granted on November 11, 1904. War Correspondent 1904 London accepted an assignment of the San Francisco Examiner to cover the Russo-Japanese War in early 1904, 
arriving in Yokohama on January 25, 1904. He was arrested by Japanese authorities in Shimonoseki, but released due to the intervention of American Ambassador Lloyd Griscom. After traveling to Korea, he was again arrested by Japanese authorizers for straying too close to the border with Manchuria without official permission and was sent back to Seoul. Released again, he was permitted to travel with the Imperial Japanese Army to the border, and to observe the Battle of the Yalu. London then made a request to William Randolph Hearst, the owner of the San Francisco Examiner to be allowed to transfer to the Imperial Russian Army, where he felt that restrictions on his reporting and his movements would be less restricted. However, before this could be arranged, he was arrested for a third time in four months, this time for assaulting his Japanese assistants, whom he accused of stealing the fodder for his horse. Released through the personal intervention of former President Theodore Roosevelt, London departed the front on June 1904. Bohemian Club On August 18, 1904, London went with his close friend, the poet George Sterling to summer hijinks at the Bohemian Grove. London was elected to honorary membership in the Bohemian Club and took part in many activities. Other noted members of the Bohemian Club during this time included Ambrose Bierce, Jellett Burgess, Alan Dunn, John Muir, and Frank Norris. Beginning in December 1914, London worked on the Acorn Planter, a California forest play, to be performed as one of the annual Grove plays, but it was never selected. It was described as too difficult to set to music. London published The Acorn Planter in 1916. Second Marriage After divorcing Madron, London married Charmian Kittredge in 1905. London was introduced to Kittredge by his Macmillan publisher, George Platt Brett, Sr., while Kittredge served as Brett's secretary. Biographer Russ Kingman called Charmian Jack's soulmate, always at his side, and a perfect match. Their time together included numerous trips, including a 1907 cruise on the yacht Snark to Hawaii in Australia. Many of London's stories are based on his visits to Hawaii, the last one for ten months beginning in December 1915. The couple also visited Goldfield, Nevada, in 1907, where they were guests of the Bond brothers. London's Dawson City landlords. The Bond brothers were working in Nevada as mining engineers. London had contrasted the concepts of the mother woman, and the mate woman in the Kempton Wake letters. His pet name for Bess had been Mother Girl. His pet name for Charmian was Mate Woman. Charmian's aunt and foster mother, a disciple of Victoria Woodhull, had raised her without prudishness. Every biographer alludes to Charmian's uninhibited sexuality. Joseph Noel calls the events from 1903 to 1905 a domestic drama that would have intrigued the pen of an Ibsen. London's had comedy relief in it and a sort of easygoing romance. In broad outline, London was restless in his first marriage, sought extramarital sexual affairs, and found, in Charmian Kittredge, not only a sexually active and adventurous partner but his future life companion. They attempted to have children. One child died at birth, and another pregnancy ended in a miscarriage. In 1906, London published in Collier's magazine his eyewitness report of the San Francisco earthquake. Beauty Wrench 1905-1916 In 1905, London purchased a 1,000 acres, 4.0 kilometers to, Ranch in Glen Ellen, Sonoma County, California, on the eastern slope of Sonoma Mountain, for $26,450. He wrote, Next to my wife, the ranch is the dearest thing in the world to me. He desperately wanted the ranch to become a successful business enterprise. Writing, always a commercial enterprise with London, now became even more a means to an end. I write for no other purpose than to add to the beauty that now belongs to me. I write a book for no other reason than to add three or four hundred acres to my magnificent estate. After 1910, his literary works were mostly pot boilers, written out of the need to provide operating income for the ranch. Storrs writes that London had taken fully to heart the vision, expressed in his agrarian fiction, of the land as the closest earthly version of Eden. 
he educated himself through the study of agricultural manuals and scientific tomes. He conceived of a system of ranching that today would be praised for its ecological wisdom. He was proud to own the first concrete silo in California, a circular piggery that he designed. He hoped to adapt the wisdom of Asian sustainable agriculture to the United States. He hired both Italian and Chinese stonemasons, whose distinctly different styles are obvious. The ranch was an economic failure. Sympathetic observers such as Storrs treat his projects as potentially feasible, and describe their failure to bad luck or to being ahead of their time. Unsympathetic historians such as Kevin Starr suggest that he was a bad manager, distracted by other concerns and impaired by his alcoholism. Starr notes that London was absent from his ranch about six months a year between 1910 and 1916, and says, he liked the show of managerial power, but not grinding attention to detail. London's workers laughed at his efforts to play big-time rancher the operation a rich man's hobby. London spent $80,000, $2,100,000 in current value, to build a 15,000-square-foot, 1,400-MD, stone mansion called Wolf House on the property. Just as the mansion was nearing completion, two weeks before the London's plan to move in, it was destroyed by fire. London's last visit to Hawaii, beginning in December 1915, lasted eight months. He met with Duke Kananamoku, Prince Joe Nakayo Kalaniano, Queen Liliawokalani and many others, before returning to his ranch in July 1916. He was suffering from kidney failure, but he continued to work. The ranch, a butting stone remnants of Wolf House, is now a National Historic Landmark and is protected in Jack London State Historic Park. Death London died November 22, 1916, in a sleeping porch in a cottage on his ranch. London had been a robust man but had suffered several serious illnesses, including scurvy in the Klondike. Additionally, during travels on the Snark, he and Charmian may have picked up unspecified tropical infections. At the time of his death, he suffered from dysentery, uremia, and late-stage alcoholism. He was in extreme pain and taking morphine, and it is possible that a morphine overdose, accidental or deliberate, may have contributed to his death. London's ashes were buried, together with those of his second wife Charmian, who died in 1955, in Jack London State Historic Park, in Glen Ellen, California, not far from the Wolf House. Jack's funeral took place on November 26, 1916, attended only by close friends relatives, and workers of the property. In accordance with his wishes, he was cremated and buried next to some pioneer children, under a rock that belonged to the Wolf House. After Charmian's death in 1955, she was also cremated and then buried with her husband in the same simple spot that her husband chose. The simple grave is marked by only a mossy boulder. Suicide Abate Many older sources describe London's death as a suicide, and some still do. This conjecture appears to be a rumor, or speculation based on incidents in his fiction writings. His death certificate gives the cause as uremia, following acute renal colic, a type of pain often described as the worst pain ever experienced, commonly caused by kidney stones. Uremia is also known as uremic poisoning. The biographer Storse writes, Following London's death, for a number of reasons, a biographical myth developed in which he has been portrayed as an alcoholic womanizer who committed suicide. Recent scholarship based upon first-hand documents challenges this caricature. Most biographers, including Russ Kingman, now agree he died of uremia aggravated by an accidental morphine overdose. London's fiction featured several suicides. In his autobiographical memoir John Barleycorn, he claims, as a youth, to have drunkenly stumbled overboard into the San Francisco Bay, some wandering fancy of going out with the tide suddenly obsessed me. He said he drifted and nearly succeeded in drowning before sobering up and being rescued by fishermen. In the denouement of the little lady of the big house, the heroine, confronted by the pain of a mortal gunshot wound, undergoes a physician-assisted suicide by morphine. Also, 
in Martin Eden, the principal protagonist, who shares certain characteristics with London, drowns himself. Accusations of Plagiarism London was vulnerable to accusations of plagiarism, both because he was such a conspicuous, prolific, and successful writer and because of his methods of working. He wrote in a letter to Elwin Hoffman, Expression, you see, with me, is far easier than invention. He purchased plots in novels from the young Sinclair Lewis and used incidents from newspaper clippings as writing material. In July 1901, two pieces of fiction appeared within the same month, London's Moon Face, in the San Francisco Argonaut, and Frank Norris' The Passing of Cockeyed Blacklock, in Century Magazine. Newspapers showed the similarities between the stories, which London said were quite different in manner of treatment, patently the same in foundation and motive. London explained both writers based their stories on the same newspaper account. A year later, it was discovered that Charles Forrest MacLean had published a fictional story also based on the same incident. Edgerton Ryerson Young claimed The Call of the Wild, 1903, was taken from Young's book My Dogs in the Northland, 1902. London acknowledged using it as a source and claimed to have written a letter to Young thanking him. In 1906, the New York World published deadly parallel columns showing 18 passages from London's short story Love of Life side by side with similar passages from a non-fiction article by Augustus Biddle and J.K. MacDonald, titled Lost in the Land of the Midnight Sun. London noted the world did not accuse him of plagiarism, but only of identity of time and situation, to which he defiantly pled guilty. The most serious charge of plagiarism was based on London's The Bishop's Vision, Chapter 7 of his novel The Iron Heel, 1908. The chapter is nearly identical to an ironic essay that Frank Harris published in 1901, titled The Bishop of London and Public Morality. Harris was incensed and suggested he should receive 1/60th of the royalties from the Iron Heel, the disputed material constituting about that fraction of the whole novel. London insisted he had clipped a reprint of the article, which had appeared in an American newspaper, and believed it to be a genuine speech delivered by the Bishop of London. Views Atheism On London's religious views he was an atheist. He is quoted as saying, I believe that when I am dead, I am dead. I believe that with my death I am just as much obliterated as the last mosquito you and I squashed. Socialism London wrote from a socialist viewpoint, which is evident in his novel The Iron Heel. Neither a theorist nor an intellectual socialist, London's socialism grew out of his life experience. As London explained in his essay, How I Became a Socialist, his views were influenced by his experience with people at the bottom of the social pit. His optimism and individualism faded, and he vowed never to do more hard physical work than necessary. He wrote that his individualism was hammered out of him, and he was politically reborn. He often closed his letters yours for the revolution. London joined the Socialist Labour Party in April 1896. In the same year, the San Francisco Chronicle published a story about the 20-year-old London giving nightly speeches in Oakland City Hall Park, an activity he was arrested for a year later. In 1901, he left the Socialist Labour Party and joined the New Socialist Party of America. He ran unsuccessfully as the high-profile socialist nominee for mayor of Oakland in 1901, receiving 245 votes, and 1905 improving to 981 votes, toured the country lecturing on socialism in 1906, and published two collections of essays about socialism, The War of the Classes, 1905, and Revolution, and other essays, 1906. Storrs notes that London regarded the Wobblies as a welcome addition to the socialist cause, although he never joined them in going so far as to recommend sabotage. Storrs mentions a personal meeting between London and Big Bill Hayward in 1912. In his late, 1913, book The Cruise of the Snark, London writes, about appeals to him for membership of the Snark's crew from office workers and other toilers, who longed for escape from the cities, and of being cheated by workmen. In his Glen Ellen Ranch years, 
London felt some ambivalence toward socialism and complained about the inefficient Italian labourers in his employ. In 1916, he resigned from the Glen Ellen chapter of the Socialist Party, but stated emphatically he did so, because of its lack of fire and fight, and its loss of emphasis on the class struggle. In an unflattering portrait of London's ranch days, California cultural historian Kevin Starr refers to this period as post-socialist, and says, By 1911, London was more bored by the class struggle than he cared to admit. Starr maintains London's socialism. George Orwell, however, identified a fascist strain in London's outlook. Racial views London shared common Californian concerns about Asian immigration and the Yellow Peril, which he used as the title of a 1904 essay. This theme was also the subject of a story he wrote in 1910 called The Unparalleled Invasion. Presented as a historical essay narrating events between 1976 and 1987, the story describes a China with an ever-increasing population taking over and colonizing its neighbors, with the intention of taking over the entire Earth. The Western nations respond with biological warfare and bombard China with dozens of the most infectious diseases. Many of London's short stories are notable for their empathetic portrayal of Mexican, the Mexican, Asian, the Tenoyo, and Hawaiian, Kulo the leper characters. London's war correspondence from the Russo-Japanese War, as well as his unfinished novel Cherry, show he admired much about Japanese customs and capabilities, which has led to big popularity of London, considered a Japanophile, among the Japanese, who consider themselves rather positively portrayed by him. In London's 1902 novel Daughter of the Snows, the character Fauna Wells has a speech about Teutonic virtues in contrast to the characteristics of other races. The scholar Andrew Ferrer, in a long essay exploring the complexity of London's views, says there is no doubt that Fauna Wells is acting as a mouthpiece for London in this passage. London's 1904 essay, The Yellow Peril, criticizes Asians. He admits, it must be taken into consideration that the above postulate is itself a product of Western race egotism, urged by our belief in our own righteousness and fostered by a faith in ourselves which may be as erroneous as our most fond race fancies. In Kulo the Leper, London describes Kulo, who is a Hawaiian leper, and thus a very different sort of superman than Martin Eden, and who fights off an entire cavalry troop to elude capture, as indomitable spiritually, a magnificent rebel. This character is based on Hawaiian leper Kalai Kalo who revolted and resisted capture from forces of the provisional government of Hawaii in the Kalalei Valley in 1893. An amateur boxer and avid boxing fan, London reported on the 1910 Johnson Jeffries fight, in which the black boxer Jack Johnson vanquished Jim Jeffries, the Great White Hope. In 1908, according to Ferrer, London praised Johnson highly, contrasting the black boxer's coolness and intellectual style, with the ape-like appearance and fighting style of his white opponent, Tommy Burns, what? On Saturday was bigness, coolness, quickness, cleverness and vast physical superiority. Because a white man wishes a white man to win, this should not prevent him from giving absolute credit to the best man, even when that best man was black. All hail to Johnson. Johnson was superb. He was impregnable. As inaccessible as Mont Blanc. Those who defend London against charges of racism cite the letter he wrote to the Japanese American Commercial Weekly in 1913. In Yukon in 1996, after the city of Whitehorse renamed two streets to honor London and Robert W. Service, protests over London's alleged racism forced the city to change the name of Jack London Boulevard back to Two Mile Hill. Works Short Stories Western writer and historian Dale L. Walker writes London's strength of utterance is at its height in his stories and they are painstakingly well constructed. To Build a Fire is the best known of all his stories. Set in the harsh Klondike, it recounts the haphazard trek of a new arrival who has ignored an old-timer's warning about the risks of traveling alone. Falling through the ice into a creek in 75 below weather, 
The unnamed man is keenly aware that survival depends on his untested skills at quickly building a fire to dry his clothes and warm his extremities. After publishing a tame version of this story, with a sunny outcome, in The Youth's Companion in 1902, London offered a second, more severe take on the man's predicament in the Century magazine in 1908. Reading both provides an illustration of London's growth and maturation as a writer. As Labour, 1994, observes, to compare the two versions is itself an instructive lesson in what distinguished a great work of literary art from a good children's story. Other stories from the Klondike period include, All Gold Canyon, about a battle between a gold prospector and a claim jumper. The Law of Life, about an aging American Indian man abandoned by his tribe and left to die. Love of Life, about a trek by a prospector across the Canadian tundra. To the Man on Trail, which tells the story of a prospector fleeing the mounted police in a sled race, and raises the question of the contrast between written law and morality. And An Odyssey of the North, which raises questions of conditional morality, and paints a sympathetic portrait of a man of mixed white and dilute ancestry. London was a boxing fan and an avid amateur boxer. A Piece of Steak is a tale about a match between older and younger boxers. It contrasts the differing experiences of youth and age but also raises the social question of the treatment of aging workers. The Mexican combines boxing with a social theme, as a young Mexican endures an unfair fight and ethnic prejudice in order to earn money with which to aid the revolution. Numerous stories London wrote would today be classified as science fiction. The Unparalleled Invasion describes germ warfare against China. Goliath about an irresistible energy weapon. The Shadow and the Flash is a tale about two brothers who take different routes to achieving invisibility. A Relic of the Pliocene is a tall tale about an encounter of a modern-day man with a mammoth. The Red One is a late story from a period when London was intrigued by the theories of the psychiatrist and writer Jung. It tells of an island tribe held in thrall by an extraterrestrial object. Some 19 original collections of short stories were published during London's brief life or shortly after his death. There have been numerous posthumous anthologies drawn from this pool of 19 books. Many of these collections have been themed around the locales of the Klondike and the Pacific. A collection of Jack London San Francisco stories was published in October 2010 by Sydney Samizdat Press. Novels London's most famous novels are The Call of the Wild, White Fang, The Sea Wolf, The Iron Heel, and Martin Eden. In a letter dated December 27, 1901, London's Macmillan publisher George Platt Brett. Senior said he believed Jack's fiction represented the very best kind of work done in America. Critic Maxwell Geismer called The Call of the Wild a beautiful prose poem. Editor Franklin Walker said that it belongs on a shelf with Walden and Huckleberry Finn. A novelist E. L. Doctor called it a mordant parable. His masterpiece. The historian Dale L. Walker commented. Critics have said his novels are episodic and resemble a linked series of short stories. Walker writes. Ambrose Bierce said of the sea wolf that the great thing, and it is among the greatest of things, is that tremendous creation, Wolf Larsen. The hewing out and setting up of such a figure is enough for a man to do in one lifetime. However, he noted, the love element, with its absurd suppressions, and impossible proprieties, is awful. The Iron Heel is interesting as an example of a dystopian novel that anticipates and influenced George Orwell's 1984. London's socialist politics are explicitly on display here. The Iron Heel meets the contemporary definition of soft science fiction. Apocrypha Jack London Credo London's literary executor, Irving Shepard quoted the Jack London Credo in an introduction to a 1956 collection of London stories. The biographer Storse notes that the passage has many marks of London style, but the only line that could be safely attributed to London was the first. The words Shepard quoted were from a story in the San Francisco Bulletin, December 2, 1916 by journalist Ernest J. Hopkins, who visited the ranch just weeks before London's death. 
Stoss notes even more so than today journalists' quotes were unreliable or even sheer inventions, and says no direct source in London's writings has been found. However, at least one line, according to Stoss, is authentic, being referenced by London, and written in his own hand, in the autograph book of Australian suffragette Vida Goldstein. Furthermore, in his short story by the Turtles of Tasman, a character, defending her ne'er do well grasshopperish father to her and like uncle, says. My father has been a king. He has lived, have you lived merely to live? Are you afraid to die? I'd rather sing one wild song and burst my heart with it, than live a thousand years watching my digestion and being afraid of the wet. When you are dust, my father will be ashes. The Scab a short diatribe on the scab is often quoted within the U.S. labor movement and frequently attributed to London. It opens. In 1913 and 1914, a number of newspapers printed the first three sentences with varying terms used instead of scab, such as knocker, stool pigeon, or scandal monger. This passage as given above was the subject of a 1974 Supreme Court case in which Justice Thurgood Marshall referred to it as a well-known piece of trade union literature, generally attributed to author Jack London. A union newsletter had published a list of scabs, which was granted to be factual and therefore not libelous, but then went on to quote the passage as the definition of a scab. The case turned on the question of whether the definition was defamatory. The court ruled that Jack London's definition of a scab is merely rhetorical hyperbole, a lusty and imaginative expression of the contempt felt by union members towards those who refused to join, and as such was not libelous and was protected under the First Amendment. Despite being frequently attributed to London, the passage does not appear at all in the extensive collection of his writings at Sonoma State University's website. However, in his book The War of the Classes he published a 1903 speech entitled The Scalb, which gave a much more balanced view of the topic. Midas Wright Anton LaVey's Church of Satan claims that Ragnar Redbeard, pseudonymous author of the 1896 book Might is Right, was London. No London biographers mention any such possibility. Roger Jacobs published an essay ridiculing this theory, arguing that in 1896 London was unfamiliar with philosophers heavily cited by Redbeard, such as Nietzsche, and had not even begun to develop his mature literary style. Bibliography Source unless otherwise specified, Williams Legacy and Honours Mount London, also known as Boundary Peak 100, on the Alaska-British Columbia boundary, in the boundary ranges of the coast mountains of British Columbia, is named for him. Jack London Square on the waterfront of Oakland, California was named for him who was honored by the United States Postal Service with a 25C slash Great American Series postage stamp. Jack London Lake, Russian, Ozerodska Londona, a mountain lake located in the upper reaches of the Kolyma River in Yegodninsky district of Magadan Oblast. Footnotes Note Both versions are available on Wikisource, To Build a Fire, 1902, To Build a Fire, In Lost Face. 1908. Citations. Reisman 2009, pages 23, London, Jack. Encyclopedia Britannica Online Library Edition. Retrieved October 5, 2011. Dictionary of American Biography Base Set. American Council of Learned Societies, 1928-1936. Reproduced in Biography Resource Center Farmington Hills Michigan Thompson Gale 2006, London 1939, pages 12, New York Times November 23, 1916, 1910, Speciality of Short Story Writing, The Writer, XXII, January-December 1910, pages 9, There are eight American writers who can get $1,000 for a short story, Robert W. Chambers, Richard Harding Davis, Jack London, O. Henry, Booth Tarkington, John Fox, Jr., Owen Wister, and Mrs. Burnett. $1,000 in 1910 is roughly equivalent to $25,000 today. Wellman, 
Joshua Wyman Descendants of Thomas Wellman, 1918, Arthur Holbrook Wellman, Boston Pages 227, The Book of Jack London. The World of Jack London. Retrieved April 7, 2011, Stores 2001, Pages 14, What supports Flora's naming Chani as the father of her son are, first, the indisputable fact of their cohabiting at the time of his conception, and second, the absence of any suggestion on the part of her associates that another man could have been responsible. Unless DNA evidence is introduced, whether or not William Chaney was the biological father of Jack London cannot be decided, Chaney would, however, be considered by her son and his children as their ancestor. Kershaw 1999, pages 53-54, London, Jack. 1917, Eight Factors of Literary Success, in Labour, 1994, pages 512. In answer to your question as to the greatest factors of my literary success, I will state that I consider them to be, vast good luck, good health, good brain, good mental and muscular correlation, poverty, reading would as signer at eight years of age. The influence of Herbert Spencer's philosophy of style. Because I got started 20 years before the fellows who are trying to start today, John Barleycorn, by Jack London at Project Gutenberg Chapters 7, 8 Describe his stealing of Mummy, the Queen of the Oyster Pirates The Queen asked me to row her ashore in my skiff. Nor did I understand Spider's grinning side remark to me, gee, there's nothing slow about you. How could it possibly enter my boy's head that a grizzled man of fifty should be jealous of me? And how was I to guess that the story of how the Queen had thrown him down on his own boat, the moment I hove in sight, was already the gleeful gossip of the waterfront? John Barleycorn, by Jack London at Project Gutenberg Chapters 7, 8 Describe his stealing of Mummy, the Queen of the Oyster Pirates The Queen asked me to row her ashore in my skiff. Nor did I understand Spider's grinning side remark to me. Gee, there's nothing slow about you. How could it possibly enter my boy's head that a grizzled man of fifty should be jealous of me? And how was I to guess that the story of how the Queen had thrown him down on his own boat, the moment I hove in sight, was already the gleeful gossip of the waterfront? London 1939, pages 41, Kingman 1979, pages 37, it was said on the waterfront that Jack had taken on a mistress. Evidently Jack believed the myth himself at times. Jack met Mummy aboard the Razzle Dazzle when he first approached French Frank about its purchase. Mummy was aboard on a visit with her sister Tess and her chaperone, Miss Hadley. It hardly seems likely that someone who required a chaperone on Saturday would move aboard as mistress on Monday, Charmy in K. London, August 1, 1922. The first story written for publication. Sonoma County. California, Jack London's.net, Kingman 1979, pages 67, McGillivray, Don, April 2009. Captain Alex McLean. University of Washington Press. ISBN 978-0-7748-1471-3. Retrieved October 6, 2011, McGillivray, Don, March 19, 2008. Captain Alex McLean, PDF. ISBN 978-0-7748-1471-3. Retrieved October 6, 2011. Footnote 55 to Batard. JackLondons.net. Retrieved August 29, 2013. First published as Diable, A Dog, The Cosmopolitan, v. 33, June 1902. 218 to 226. This tale became Batard in 1904 when included in FM. The same story, with minor changes, was also called Batard when it appeared in the Sunday Illustrated magazine of the Memphis, Tennessee. Commercial Appeal, September 28, 1913, pages 7 to 11. London received $141.25 for this story on May 27, 1902. Best dog story ever written, Call of the Wild, excerpted from Kingman 1979, Hamilton, 1986, as cited by other sources, Stores 2001, pages 61, both acknowledged that they were not marrying out of love, 
Kingman 1979, pages 98, Stores 2001, pages 66, Mommy Girl and Daddy Boy, Kingman 1979, pages 121, Noel 1940, pages 150, She's Devoted to Purity, Stores 2001, pages 80, Devoted to Purity. Code Words, Kingman 1979, pages 139, Kauner, Rotem, 2006. Historical Dictionary of the Russo-Japanese War. ISBN 0-8108-4927-5, The Scarecrow Press. Page 212, London and Taylor 1987, pages 394, Witchland 2007, pages 131, The Sailing of the Snark, by Alan Dunn, Sunset, May 1907. A.B. Day 1996, pages 113 to 119, London 2003, pages 59, copy of John Barleycorn inscribed Dear Mate Woman, You Know. You Have Helped Me Bury the Long Sickness and the White Logic. Numerous other examples in same source, Kingman 1979, pages 124, Storse 1999, pages 112, Kershaw 1999, Pages 133, Noel 1940, pages 146, Joseph Theroux. They came to write in Hawaii. Spirit of Aloha, Aloha Airlines, March April 2007. He said, Life's not a matter of holding good cards, but sometimes playing a poor hand well. His last magazine piece was titled My Hawaiian Aloha. His final, unfinished novel, Eyes of Asia, was set in Hawaii. Jack London. My Hawaiian Aloha. From Stories of Horairi, Mutual Publishing, Honolulu, 1916. Reprinted with permission in Spirit of Aloha, November-December 2006. On this day, November 23, 1916, obituary, Jack London dies suddenly on ranch. The New York Times. Retrieved January 6, 2014. Columbia Encyclopedia Jack London. Beset in his later years by alcoholism and financial difficulties, London committed suicide at the age of 40. The Jack London Online Collection, Jack London's Death Certificate, Mayo Clinic, 2008. Kidney Stone Channel. U.S. News & World Report. Retrieved April 23, 2008. The Jack London Online Collection, Biography, Did Jack London Commit Suicide? The World of Jack London. The Literary Zoo. Life 49. Jan Jun 1907. Pages 130. Young, Edgerton Ryerson. Dictionary of Canadian Biography. Retrieved January 6, 2014. Memorable Manitobans, Edgerton Ryerson Young, 1840-1909. The Manitoba Historical Society. Retrieved January 7, 2014. Is Jack London a plagiarist? The Literary Digest 34, 337. 1907, Kingman 1979, pages 118, Letter to the Bookman, April 10, 1906, quoted in full in Jack London, Dale L. Walker, Jean Campbell Reisman, 2000. No mentor but myself, Jack London on writing and writers. Stanford University Press. 978-0804736350. Pages 97, The World, however, did not charge me with plagiarism. It charged me with identity of time and situation. Certainly I plead guilty, and I am glad that the world was intelligent enough not to charge me with identity of language. Jack London, Dale L. Walker, Jean Campbell Reisman, 2000. No mentor but myself. Jack London on Writing and Writers. Stanford University Press. 978-0804736350. Pages 121, The Controversy with Frank Harris began in the Vanity Fair issue of April 14, 1909, in an article by Harris entitled, How Mr. Jack London Writes a Novel. Using parallel columns, Harris demonstrated that a portion of his article the Bishop of London and Public Morality, which appeared in a British periodical, The Candid Friend, on May 25, 1901, 
had been used almost word for word in his 1908 novel, The Iron Heel, Stuart Gabble, 2012. Jack London, A Man in Search of Meaning, A Jungian Perspective. Author House. Pages 14. ISBN 9781477283375. Thousand when he was tramping, arrested and jailed for one month for vagrancy at about 19 years of age, he listed atheist as his religion on the necessary forms, casual, 1997. Access state equals requires L equals, help, who's who in hell, a handbook and international directory for humanists, free thinkers, naturalists, rationalists, and non-theists. Publisher, Barricade Books, January 1, 2000, ISBN 978 to 1569801581. HTTP colon slash slash London dot sonoma dot edu slash writing slash war of the classes slash socialist dot html see labor nineteen ninety four pages five hundred forty six for one example a letter from London to William E. Walling dated november thirtieth nineteen oh nine stores two thousand one pages one hundred stores two thousand one pages one hundred fifty six Kershaw 1999, pages 245. Star, Kevin, 1973. Americans and the California Dream. Oxford University Press. ISBN 0-19-501-644-0. Retrieved March 2, 2013. George Orwell, 2000. George Orwell, My Country Right or Left, 1940-1943. David R. Godine. Pages 31. A.B. The Jack London Online Collection, The Yellow Peril, The Jack London Online Collection, The Unparalleled Invasion, Jack London's W.A.R., Dale L. Walker, The World of Jack London, www.jacklondons.net. According to London's reportage, the Russians were sluggish in battle, while the Japanese understand the utility of things. Reserves they consider should be used not only to strengthen the line, but in the moment of victory to clinch victory hard and fast. Verily, nothing short of a miracle can wreck a plan they have once started and put into execution. Jean Campbell Reisman, University of Georgia Press, 2009, pages 323 to 324. Andrew J. Furrer, High Beam Research, Studies in American Fiction. September 22, 1994. Jack London on the Fight, The Argus, Monday 28 December 1908. Labour, Earl, Robert C. Lates, 3, and I. Marlowe Shepard, The Letters of Jack London, Volume 3, 1913-1916 Stanford University Press 1988. Pages 1219. Letter to Japanese American Commercial Weekly, August 25, 1913. The races of mankind will grow up and laugh their childish quarrels. Lundberg, ABC Dale L. Walker, Jack London, The Stories, The World of Jack London, Jack London, San Francisco Stories, edited by Matthew Asprey. Preface by Roger Jacobs. These are the five novels selected by editor Donald Pizer for inclusion in the Library of America series. Kershaw 1999, pages 109. Letters of Ambrose Bierce, ed. S. T. Joshi, Tiambak Sunan Joshi, David E. Schultz, Columbus, Ohio State University Press, 2003. Orwell, The Authorized Biography by Michael Sheldon, HarperCollins ISBN 978-0-06-092161-3. A. B. The Jack London Online Collection, Credo, A. B. Thurgood Marshall, June 25, 1974. Letter Carriers V. Austin, 418 U.S. 264, 1974. Retrieved May 23, 2006. Callan, Claude, 1913. Cracks at the Crowd, Fort Worth Star Telegram, December 30, 1913. Pages 6, Seth The Rule Review, After God Had Finished Making the Rattlesnake, the Toad and the Vampire, He Had Some Awful Substance Left, With Which He Made the Knocker. Were it not for being irreverent, 
we would suggest that he was hard up for something to do when he made any of those pests you call his handiwork, the food for your think tank, the Macon Daily Telegraph, August 23, 1914, pages 3, Madame Gain is found guilty. Jury decides woman conducted house of ill fame at the Clifton Hotel, the Duluth News Tribune, February 5, 1914, pages 12, TWH. 1914, Review of the Masonic Country Press, The Eastern Star The New Age Magazine, a monthly publication devoted to Freemasonry and its relation to present-day problems, published by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry for the Southern Jurisdiction of the United States. June, 1917, pages 283, Scandal Munger, After God Had Finished Making the Rattlesnake, the Toad and the Vampire, He Had Some Awful Substance Left, with which he made a scandal monger. A scandal monger is a two-legged animal with a corkscrew soul, a water-sogged brain and a combination backbone made of jelly and glue. Where other men have their hearts he carries a tumor of decayed principles. When the scandal monger comes down the street honest men turn their backs, the angels weep tears in heaven, and the devil shuts the gates of hell to keep him out. Anon http colon slash slash london dot sonoma dot edu slash writing slash war of the classes slash scab dot html jacobs 1999 abcdefghijkl the jack london online collection writings how i became a socialist the comrade an illustrated socialist monthly volume 2 number 6 march 1903 Jack London, Books. Amazon.com September 9, 2009. Retrieved August 26, 2011. London, Mount. BC Geographical Names. HTTP colon slash slash apps dot gov BC car pub BC GNWS names slash 21188. His desire to attend university and pursue a career as a writer. Lionel lent London tuition money to attend college. London desperately wanted to attend the University of California, Berkeley. In 1896, after a summer of intense studying to pass certification exams, he was admitted. Financial circumstances forced him to leave in 1897 and he never graduated. No evidence suggests that London wrote for student publications while studying at Berkeley. While at Berkeley, London continued to study and spend time at Iron Old Saloon, where he was introduced to the sailors and adventurers who would influence his writing. In his autobiographical novel, John Barleycorn, London mentioned the pub's likeness 17 times. Iron Old's was the place where London met Alexander Maclean, a captain known for his cruelty at sea, on whom the protagonist in London's novel The Sea Wolf, Wolf Larsen, is based. Lionel's first and last chance saloon is now unofficially named Jack London's Rendezvous in his honor. Gold Rush and First Success On July 12, 1897, London, aged 21, and his sister's husband Captain Shepard sailed to join the Klondike Gold Rush. This was the setting for some of his first successful stories. London's time in the Klondike, however, was detrimental to his health. Like so many other men who were malnourished in the goldfields, London developed scurvy. His gums became swollen, leading to the loss of his four front teeth. A constant gnawing pain affected his hip and leg muscles, and his face was stricken with marks that always reminded him of the struggles he faced in the Klondike. Father William Judge, the saint of Dawson, had a facility in Dawson that provided shelter, food and any available medicine to London and others. His struggles there inspired London's short story, To Build a Fire, 1902, revised in 1908, which many critics assess as his best. His landlords in Dawson were mining ended in the San Francisco Chronicle of June 4, 1875, Cheney demanded that she have an abortion. When she refused, he disclaimed responsibility for the child. In desperation, she shot herself. She was not seriously wounded but she was temporarily deranged. After giving birth, Flora turned the baby over to ex-slave Virginia Prentice, who remained a major maternal figure throughout London's life. Late in 1876, 
Flora Wellman married John London, a partially disabled Civil War veteran, and brought her baby John, later known as Jack, to live with the newly married couple. The family moved around the San Francisco Bay Area before settling in Oakland, where London completed grade school. In 1897, when he was 21 and a student at the University of California, Berkeley, London searched for and read the newspaper accounts of his mother's suicide attempt and the name of his biological father. He wrote to William Chaney, then living in Chicago. Chaney responded that he could not be London's father because he was impotent. He casually asserted that London's mother had relations with other men and averred that she had slandered him when she said he insisted on an abortion. Cheney concluded that he was more to be pitied than London. London was devastated by his father's letter. In the months following, he quit school at Berkeley and went to the Klondike. Early Life London was born near Third and Brannan's Streets in San Francisco. The house burned down in the fire after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. The California Historical Society placed a plaque at the site in 1953. Although the family was working class, it was not as impoverished as London's later accounts claimed. London was essentially self-educated. In 1885, London found and read Uda's long Victorian novel Sina. He credited this as the seed of his literary success. In 1886, he went to the Oakland Public Library and found a sympathetic librarian. Jack London John Griffith Jack London was an American author, journalist, and social activist. He was a pioneer in the then burgeoning world of commercial magazine fiction and was one of the first fiction writers to obtain worldwide celebrity and a large fortune from his fiction alone. Some of his most famous works include The Call of the Wild and White Fang, both set in the Klondike Gold Rush, as well as the short stories To Build a Fire, An Odyssey of the North, and Love of Life. He also wrote of the South Pacific in such stories as The Pearls of Parley, and The Heathen, and of the San Francisco Bay Area in The Sea Wolf. London was a passionate advocate of unionization, socialism and the rights of workers and wrote several powerful works dealing with these topics such as his dystopian novel The Iron Heel, his non-fiction Expose the People of the Abyss, and The War of the Classes. Family Jack London's mother, Flora Wellman, was the fifth and youngest child of Pennsylvania Canal builder Marshall Wellman and his first wife, Eleanor Garrett Jones. Marshall Wellman was descended from Thomas Wellman, an early Puritan settler in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Flora left Ohio and moved to the Pacific Coast when her father remarried after her mother died. In San Francisco, Flora worked as a music teacher and spiritualist claiming to channel the spirit of an Indian chief. Biographer Clary Storse and others believe London's father was astrologer William Chaney. Flora Wellman was living with Chaney in San Francisco when she became pregnant. Whether Wellman and Chaney were legally married is unknown. Most San Francisco civil records were destroyed by the extensive fires that followed the 1906 earthquake. Nobody knows what name appeared on his birth certificate. Storse notes that in his memoirs, Chaney refers to London's mother Flora Wellman as having been his wife. He also cites an advertisement in which Flora called herself Florence Wellman Chaney. According to Flora Wellman's account, as record engineers Marshall Latham Bond and Louis Whitford Bond, educated at Yale and Stanford. The brother's father, Judge Hiram Bond, was a wealthy mining investor. The Bonds, especially Hiram, were active Republicans. Marshall Bond's diary mentions friendly sparring with London on political issues as a camp pastime. London left Oakland with a social conscience and socialist leanings. He returned to become an activist for socialism. He concluded that his only hope of escaping the work trap was to get an education and sell his brains. He saw his writing as a business, his ticket out of poverty, and, he hoped, a means of beating the wealthy at their own game. On returning to California in 1898, London began working deliberately to get published, a struggle described in his novel, Martin Eden, serialized in 1908 published in 1909. 
His first published story since high school was To the Man on Trail, which has frequently been collected in anthologies. When the Overland Monthly offered him only $5 for it, and was slow paying, London came close to abandoning his writing career. In his words, literally and literally I was saved, when the black cat accepted his story a thousand deaths, and paid him $40, the first money I ever received for a story. London began his writing career just as new printing technologies enabled lower cost production of magazines. This resulted in a boom in popular magazines aimed at a wide public and a strong market for short fiction. In 1900, he made $2,500 in writing, about $71,000 in today's currency. Among the works he sold to magazines was a short story known as either Diable, 1902, or Batard, 1904, in two editions of the same basic story. London received $141.25 for this story on May 27, 1902. In the text, a cruel French Canadian brutalizes his dog, and the dog retaliates and kills the Ina Coolbrith, who encouraged his learning. She later became California's first poet laureate and an important figure in the San Francisco literary community. In 1889, London began working 12 to 18 hours a day at Ikmet's cannery. Seeking a way out, he borrowed money from his black foster mother Virginia Prentice, bought the sloop Razzle Dazzle from an oyster pirate named French Frank, and became an oyster pirate. In his memoir, John Barleycorn, he claims to have stolen French Frank's mistress Mammy. After a few months, his sloop became damaged beyond repair. London became hired as a member of the California Fish Patrol. In 1893, he signed on to the sealing schooner Sophie Sutherland, bound for the coast of Japan. When he returned, the country was in the grip of the Panic of 93 and Oakland was swept by labor unrest. After grueling jobs in a jute mill and a street railway power plant, he joined Kelly's army and began his career as a tramp. In 1894, he spent 30 days for vagrancy in the Erie County Penitentiary at Buffalo, New York. In the road, he wrote, Manhandling was merely one of the very minor unprintable horrors of the Erie County pen. I say imprintable. And in justice I must also say undescribable. They were unthinkable to me until I saw them, and I was no spring chicken in the ways of the world and the awful abysses of human degradation. It would take a deep plummet to reach bottom in the Erie County pen, and I do but skim lightly and facetiously the surface of things as I there saw them. After many experiences as a hobo and a sailor, he returned to Oakland and attended Oakland High School. He contributed a number of articles to the high school's magazine, The Aegis. His first published work was Typhoon Off the Coast of Japan, an account of his sailing experiences. As a schoolboy, London often studied at Arnold's first and last chance saloon, a portside bar in Oakland. At 17, he confessed to the bar's owner, John Arnold.